In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, the Lord told uh, King Samuel, I, I mean the prophet Samuel, to go to King Saul and to declare to him that the Lord had sought for a man. And he described the man as a man after his own heart. And, of course, we know that that man that God was seeking for was a young guitar player on the backside of the hills of Bethlehem, about 15 years old, or possibly even younger at that time. And it says in Second Chronicles 16.9 that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro all over the earth, searching for men and women whose heart is given fully to the Lord. God searching for men and women that have the YES, the capital Y-E-S in their spirit. The aggressive, abandoned YES in their spirit. They're not uh, even a, a willing to allow their weakness to disqualify them. Even in their weakness, they pursue passionately into the heart of God. Some people uh, think that their weakness is a valid reason to cancel themselves out in the spirit. But God raised up this man, David, as a witness, as a testimony. It says in Isaiah 55, verse 4, He was a testimony and a witness of the sure mercies of David, that God had made a covenant with the people that he would give the people the sure mercies of David, which means that even in their weakness they could go hard after God and they did not have to cancel themselves out. They didn't have to to negate their spiritual journey and progress because they confronted their weakness. They would rise up and press in with confidence. They would repent and press in with confident love into the heart of God. Now, people that refuse to repent, that's a different story. But the tragedy of the body of Christ is the millions that repent sincerely and then that spirit of negation, they they cancel themselves out because of wrong thinking. In Isaiah 55, verse 3, God says, I have made a covenant with the people, an everlasting covenant. I will establish the sure mercies of David, the mercies you can count on, even the ones I gave David. And then verse 4 of Isaiah 55, it says, I made him a witness, a testimony to all the peoples and all the commanders and all the leaders. So whether you're a new believer, just a, a new believer in the body of Christ, or whether you're a mature apostolic leader, The life of David is a reliable witness and testimony of how God wants to lead you and how God wants you to respond to him and how God will respond back to you and how God feels about you. It's a fantastic reality. And God looked at this young boy and said, 1 Samuel 13, 14, that young boy has a heart after me. That's a very, very important statement. God is the one that declared that statement over David. A man after God's own heart. What a statement. Only God has the right to call a person by that identity. And uh, there's more about David than any other man in the Bible besides Jesus. It's not an accident. God gave more print, more text, more time and space in the Scripture to David than any other man in history. And uh, we love, everybody loves the life of David. I mean, what's not to love? It's a little confusing sometimes because the thing that the Lord did, there's more of David's failure. I've never really added this up, but just by virtue of the fact that there's more about David than anybody in the Bible besides Jesus, there's more of his failure than anybody in the Bible. I mean, I guess if you get one, you get the other. But I look at King David and I go, Lord, there's so many mistakes, so many Mess-ups. I know if he can, I can. And the last part of the Lord's encouragement. He's a witness. He's a testimony. Isaiah 55, verse 4. What's it mean to be a person after God's own heart? I'm going to give three different definitions. Number one, and I'm going to focus in on one. And all three of them uh, need to be uh, pressed. We need to press into God's heart on all three levels. We don't have to pick one over the three. We want to press into all three of them. Throughout the seasons of our life. It's God's gift to us to to press into God's heart. To encounter God's heart on these three levels. It's His gift. It's part of our inheritance. To operate in the grace of God in all three levels. All three different uh, focuses. Number one. David was committed to obey the commands of God's heart. David was a man who was passionate about obedience. 
The yes in his spirit was real. He had a fierce determination to obey. It was not, it wasn't uh, uh, false. He came up short. His sincerity was not nullified by his immaturity. His sincerity was intact when his immaturity was dominating him in different seasons. In Isaiah, I mean in Psalms 40, verse 8, David says, I have come to do thy will, O God. Thy will is my delight. Being a person after God's own heart is a person with a fierce determination to obey God's word, to obey the commands of God's heart. We never, ever minimize. We never, never can play down the necessity of giving ourselves in a spirit of obedience to the heart of God, to say yes to what God says. Secondly, David was a man after God's own heart in that he was a student of God's emotions. He was a student of the emotions of God's heart. Psalm 27, 4, this one thing, I gaze on your beauty. David was a, had a lifelong preoccupation of being a student of God's emotions, the personality of God. Vast subject, one of, probably my favorite subject in life. But that's not what I want to focus on tonight. Number three, the area I want to look at is that David, David persistently was seeking the fullness of God's power in his life. It wasn't enough for David to be a man of obedience. It was not enough for David to be a man of intimacy, to understand the emotions. He wanted to be a man who moved in the realm of the power of God for his generation. He wanted the power of God to touch his heart. He wanted the power of God to touch his circumstances. He wanted to have blessed circumstances. He wanted the power of God to touch his ministry. He Fulfilled what Paul would, uh, what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31. Seek earnestly the greater gifts. Seek earnestly that you would operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, Paul went on to say, he says, especially that you would operate in the spirit of prophecy, that you would know the mind of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. You would operate in a prophetic anointing. David was seeking. David was seeking the fullness of God's power. As we train young people here and others besides, we want to give them a vision to have everything that God will give the human heart in this generation. Beloved, we want to pursue God not in rhetoric, not in religious rhetoric, but in sincerity and in truth. We want to pursue God until we experience everything that God will give the human heart in this hour of history. Because every hour of history, there's different strategies and different measurements, measures of grace that God will give and different uh, administrations of what He's doing in that Kairos hour of history. So one, one season, there's a, a greater release sovereignly than another season. And it's not my business to care which it is. My business is to press into the fullness of what God is offering the human heart in that season of human history. And of course, I believe we're in the generation of the Lord's returning, so I believe that we have a measure that far surpasses even the book of Acts. A passionate pursuit of the fullness of the power of God. Well, I said Isaiah 22. Let's go to Psalm 132. Maybe we'll come back to Isaiah 30. We really need to come back to this. I'm going to put my pen here. Just to... Psalm 132. Look at David's heart. Psalm 32, verse 1. Rem Lord, remember David. Remember all of his afflictions. Remember how David swore to the Lord, how David vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house. Surely I will not go to the comfort of my own bed. Surely I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. He said, until there is a breakthrough in my generation of encountering God where the glory of God resides as a habitation among his people. This is uh, one of the foundational verses that the Lord uh, gave in the early days of IHOP. That God began to gather some people together who had a fierce determination 
David said he swore to the Lord. He vowed to the mighty one. I will not pursue my own ministry. I will not pursue the comfort of my own house. The comfort of my own domestic situation. Until there's a breakthrough of God. A dwelling. A habitation of the power of God. In the midst of the land. It was not enough for David. To seek the Lord privately. And experience the spiritual ecstasies of intimacy and gazing on duty. He wanted a breakthrough. He wanted a place of blessing where the glory of God would be manifest for the good of the people and for the fame of His name. He wanted a demonstration of power. Psalm 69, it's the same thing. Psalm 69, verse 9. Common passage. Well, let's start in verse 7. For your sake, O God, I have borne reproach. David was willing to sacrifice. He's talking about basically the same thing, uh, building the house of prayer in essence. But it's not the building of the house of prayer. That's just our language here in our local context. It's seeing a, not a visitation, not an 18-month time where the grace of God was released in a new measure. We're talking about a habitation. Where the glory of God was manifest to meet the need of the people and to establish the fame of His name in the land. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about a habitation. David's, and that's what David's talking about here in Psalm 67. Verse, Psalm 69, verse 7. Because for your sake I've borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. I've become like a stranger to my brothers. My brothers don't even know me. I'm an alien to my mother's children. My own family members look at me and mock me because of my pursuits. And he goes on to describe why he has become estranged from his own family because zeal for the house of God has consumed me. He goes, I, I'm alive with the vision to see the house of God established. Psalm 132. I'm consumed. I cannot go right. I cannot go left. I don't live the way I used to live until there's a release of the manifest power of God, until the glory of God is manifest in the land. He says, the reproaches of those who reproach God have fallen upon me. Beloved, the body of Christ, or the people of God, same thing, in our culture, in this time in history, will not applaud this kind of zeal consuming you. Because they will assume, if it consumes you, it's supposed to consume them. And that's not what they're interested in right now. And they will come up with theological and emotional and relational reasons and, argu reasons and arguments to write you off so they can free their own conscience from this vision that haunts them that it's possible God has more for them. And whenever a stagnant, spiritually dull person touches passion in the life of another, it either awakens them, it's life to life, or it angers them, it's death to death. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 2.16, he says, the fragrance of Christ is either life unto life. He says, when I touch with the passion of God, a hungry spirit, it awakens them for greater hunger, or it makes them angry. They go from death to death. They go into greater hardness, and they begin to pile on arguments and accusations in their soul as to why this isn't for them and why this isn't God's heart and why this is out of bounds and why this isn't for today and they'll mount up arguments and they don't know it but they will drive their own soul into new realms of death. They will go from death to death. Another way to say it is spiritual dullness and boredom unto spiritual dullness and boredom to the greater measure. An unbeliever can touch the, a man or woman with this passion and get awakened and become a fiery new convert and follow right into their footsteps. A lethargic pastor, a leader that's been going, I mean, someone in the body of Christ 40 years that isn't a leader, they can touch the passion, even in a young person, and be awakened and go from life to life. Or they'll touch it, they'll be repelled by it, and they will, they will, uh, they will, uh, uh, bear down and the arguments will mount up in their soul and they will go from death to death. It's an amazing thing. Everybody loves the power of God in a certain way. Mostly we love studying about the power of God. That's a little different than loving the power of God, but the power of God, but the thing that we don't really like is the path to the power of God. 
Because the path to the power of God is invasive. It's unbiased. It's not political. It presses into the private places. It's invasive. It moves into the secret places and it demands and it, and it makes, it makes demands upon our soul that are unrelenting. Here's what it says in verse 9. The reproaches of those who reproach you, God, have fallen on me. I wept and I'm chasing my soul with fasting and that became my reproach. He embraced, he had zeal for the house of God and he embraced the grace of fasting and it became a reproach even amongst his own family members. They wagged their heads and wrote him off. It doesn't have to be natural family members. It can be spiritual family members. And look at this. He goes, I made sackcloth my garment, verse 11, and I became a byword to my family. That's what he says to them. He's talking about the family. And then it became worse than that. After I became a byword to those that I was so familiar with, then those who sat at the gate, the elders, spoke against me, and it went way beyond that. I became the song of even the drunkards on the street. They mocked me. They said David's let lost his way. Beloved, God's raising up a people across the earth. There is no one place. He's doing it in a thousand cities of the earth. It's the zeal of God that's awakening the zeal for the house. It's the zeal of God awakening this. Some people say, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there to get this, to go get that. Beloved, this thing is, is alive and available because it's in the heart of God for every single born-again believer on the planet. They don't have to go up to this mountain or that mountain, Jesus told the Samaritan woman in John 4. He says, because there's a time that's coming where you will worship God in spirit and truth right where you're at. And he'll make himself accessible and available to you to the degree of your hunger. But look at this. David became, he sat in the gate and he became like the song of the drunkards. Not only did his family wag their head and became a byword, where the elders in the gate, the leaders in the body of Christ, wrote a letter censoring him. This is dangerous. It's what they said about John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11, verse 17 and 18. Jesus said, John the Baptist, he came neither eating nor drinking. He came in the grace of fasting, and the nation said he has a demon. Originally, Originally, they rejoiced in John's light, it says in John 5. They rejoiced for a short season in his light. The nation of Israel rejoiced in John's ministry for a brief season, but it was a short-lived season because in a short amount of time, they said he was demonized and dangerous to the community of Israel. And this is the passage Jesus quoted from the life of David. In John chapter 2, verse 17, when he walked into the temple, he said, Zeal for the house has consumed me. Read Psalm 67. And I will be a byword to my own brothers, which he was. They did not believe in him. I will become censored by the elders in the gate. And I will become mocked by the drunkards on the street. Because I'm abandoned to God and I'm not apologizing for my intensity for my God. Beloved people... People of God aren't interested in that. Many, many of God's people are not interested in that. And I'm not saying that to make you kind of feel heroic if you are, because it's all of grace anyway. It's the gift of God to you. Your desire for Him is His gift to you. You didn't conjure it up. You positioned yourself, you did, to receive it. But it was His power. Putting yourself, putting our cold heart in front of the bonfire doesn't earn the fire The reason that the bonfire falls out and melts our cold heart is because the power of the fire, not the power of the ice cube put in front of it. The power is in the flaming fire. Any old ice cube can melt if it gets in front of the fire. It's really true. And some people get this kind of sense of heroic and nobility, and I said, you're just an, an old ice cube that had sense to get in front of the fire. The power and the glory is the fire, not in the posturing ourselves before it. When that fire begins to tenderize and melt, that's God's gift to us. Well, I'm not saying uh, this to you uh, except to say that as you pursue this, it's not enough to want to obey God's commands. I want to obey. I want to be a man of profound obedience. It's not enough to have intimacy by discovering the emotions of God's heart. 
I want to study the beauty of his heart in all dimensions. Oh, I love that. That is my favorite. Not kind of my favorite, just is. But beloved, there's more. I want a dwelling of God in the earth. I want a place where the lame and the blind and the sick can come. Matthew chapter 17, that guy came to Jesus. He says, I came to your disciples with my demonized son, and they could not help me. That, that verse, that torments me sometimes. It, it causes pain to my soul, that sentence, because that's where the church is in the Western world. My demonized son, I brought him to your disciples. Matthew chapter 17, it's about verse 10 or something like that, 15, something like that. Matthew 17 says, and your disciples could not cure him. So it's not only the compassion for the demonized boy, but it's zeal for the fame of his name. It's both and. And we don't have to pick between the two because they're one and the same reality to God. I said, God, we've got to have a place, a dwelling place. Not just where you're worshipped, where your manifest glory does what you do best. It manifests compassion on the needy and glorifies your son in the process. Magnifies the beauty of Christ Jesus in a natural realm. And we don't have to separate the compassion on the needy from the magnifying of God in the natural realm. The glorifying of his name. They are one reality to God. God wants to awaken new spiritual hunger. He wants to awaken hunger. He wants us to have a vision. To have everything God will give the human heart. Now, beloved, I, I don't, I'm not trying to sound heroic, but I, I'm saying this because I want you to say it. I'm not waiting for this to be popular. I'm not waiting for a new trend. I don't care if it ever is popular. I'm burnt. I have already burned the boats. I've burned the bridges. I'm going for it. And I want to say unashamedly, if you don't know the way, I can show you the way. I'm longing for the breakthrough, but I know the way. I'm on the path. And I'm unashamedly going for it with the full strength of my being in the grace of God. Which in the grace of God, I find new strength, a renewed strength as it relapses. As it, as, as it lapses. But I, I tell you this, we need a few good men and women. I don't care if they're 15 years old or 90. We just need a few thousand of them, maybe 10,000 in the land that are saying, I'm going for this. I'm not waiting for the famous guys to do it. I'm not waiting for the best-selling book. I'm going for it regardless if anybody goes for it. I am going for it, and it's enough for me to go for it. And if God gives me marvelous comrades on the journey, which he will, then that is just icing on the cake. But I'm going for it no matter who else does it. This is what David had as the gift of God operating in his being on the backside of that desert. He was pressing into this thing. I'm not waiting for others to do it. I'm going for it. And the way is not mysterious. It truly is not. That's why I can say with boldness, I can show you the way. It's not mysterious. You don't have to have a visitation to go to heaven, Moses said. I believe it was in Deuteronomy 30. He says, it's not, the word is near you, even in your mouth. You don't need to ascend to heaven and talk to an angel. Or you don't have to descend to the, to the depths of of hell to have some encounter with a demon, it's as close to you as speaking the clarity. Just press in in the very, very simple ways that Scripture just defines. It is not mysterious. And it's not out of reach. You don't need a visitation to do this thing. It's near you. It's in your heart. It's in your mouth. It's as simple as aligning up and declaring the focus of your heart. I'm going for it, and I'm going to lay my time and my schedule and give myself to it. And over time, things begin to move. Jesus said the great statement, blessed are those who hunger, they shall be satisfied. Blessed are those that hunger, they hunger. Again, our gift, our, our desire for God is his gift to us, but there's a realm of blessing. Now that hunger can be fed and that hunger can be diminished and quenched. The most significant thing about your life is how you feed or how you quench Spiritual hunger, when God gives you those initial, those initial coals of fire, He gives them as a gift. 
those burning embers he gives us, those moments of impartation where our soul is inspired and we're going to go. Those are like burning coals he gives to our heart. And he says, now you can fan it or you can quench it, but the giving of that coal is my gift to you. Now you respond to it one way or the other. It will grow or it will go out. And what has happened? We come to a point of inspiration. And we, we don't esteem the inspiration as the work of God. Some of you tonight will leave this building with a new setting of your heart. Beloved, that's God putting a new ember, a new burning coal in your soul. He'll use a sermon. He'll use a testimony. He'll use a dream. He'll use a miraculous experience where something happens and your soul is awakened and renewed in a new way and a fresh fire. And the Lord says, that is a coal I've given you. That is a gift. You will either now fan the flame or you will quench the flame, but that fire won't be the same in a month. It will be stronger or it will be lesser. And the only way you can, the only way you can keep that which you have is by gaining ground. You cannot hold the ground you have today in the spirit without taking more ground. Absolutely cannot. Some people have these high experiences. They gain ground and they get a certain place in God and they experience something in God and they think this is that. And I tell you the truth, the law of the Spirit, if you don't take more ground, you will lose that ground in a short amount of months. It's a living, vital relationship. You can only keep what you have by pressing into more. You can never keep what you have by staying in a static position of staying where you are. It's impossible. It's impossible. Jesus said in Mark chapter 4, verse 24, he says, if you have that, the measure you have, if you use it, if you use it, Mark 4, 24, if you use it, I will give you more. And if you don't use it, I will take that which you have, I will take it from you. Beloved, it's true, and you know it's true. And I'm talking about even spiritual hunger. The hunger that you had a month ago, a year ago, 10 years ago, whatever. God gave you a gift. He gave you, he, he created a, a, a circumstance where your heart was encountered something. Again, a dream, a testimony, a sermon, a, a person in, in a fellowship where your soul was made alive in a fresh, a fresh kiss of God. And the Lord says, what did you do with it? And the Lord says, I, I don't know. I just thought it was a kind of a good meeting. The Lord says, no, that was my gift to you. What did you do with it? Well, I didn't even esteem it as anything. I just thought it was kind of, I don't know. Just kind of let it go. When Isaiah chapter, let's go to Isaiah 22. I got my pen here. Isaiah 22, verse 22. Jesus would quote this as well. Jesus said, the key to the house of David, I will lay on his shoulder. Eliakim is who he's talking to. It doesn't matter the man he's talking to. It's, it's the promise. I, the key of David, I will lay upon his shoulder. He will open doors and nobody shall shut. And he shall shut doors that nobody should open. Jesus quotes this in Revelation 3.8. When the key of David, when the heart of David... The, the people after God's own heart like David, they're, go, they're going after full, a hundredfold obedience. They're going after a hundredfold intimacy to become students of emotions, but they're also going after a hundredfold power. They're going after all three, and they got this heart of David. Beloved, you know what happens? You become a, in the purpose of God, collectively, the key of David, the authority in the realm of the Spirit to open and shut Doors in the Spirit is God's answer to the people after God's own heart like David. When God finds a corporate people, he spoke this to the whole church in, in uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. He said to the entire church, he says, corporately, you will operate in this Spirit and you will find out you have keys to open doors in the Spirit to whole geographic areas. You can shut negative doors. That involves Revelation 6. 10 to 12 powers and principalities will be impacted by your life in the spirit on the earth. You can shut negative doors and you can open positive doors. John 1 verse 51, Jesus said, there will be an open heaven. There will be a doorway of blessing and you will see, some of you will witness the doorway of blessing opened in the spirit over you. I am absolutely convinced 
That when a, when a, a company of people go after this thing together in the heart of David, God manifests to them the ability to open and shut doors in the spirit and open and shut doors in the natural. Because when they open in the spirit, they open in the natural a few minutes later. And when they're shut in the spirit, negative doors of darkness, then things dry up in the natural that are evil. It really does open and shut doors. Turn to Jude, right before the book of Revelation. Right before the book of Revelation, Jude, verse 3. I've been just staring at this verse. I love this verse. I've looked at it. It's been an inspiration for years. Jude, the, the Lord's brother, the brother of James, the brother of the Lord Jesus, Jude, verse 3, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. Listen, here it is. I found it necessary to write to you, to exhort you, to contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. Here's what he said. He said, you must contend, you must fight earnestly to maintain your place in your relationship with God. That is described by the early uh, experience of the apostles. The faith once delivered. What is the faith once delivered? There's the apostolic doctrine. We must contend for that. But beloved, frankly, I find that's by far the easiest thing to contend for. You can have a cold heart and contend for biblical orthodoxy. And the people who insisted on biblical orthodoxy are the ones that murdered Jesus and John the Baptist. I mean, they were voting on John the Baptist to be out. They didn't actually do it. Herod did it, but they didn't like John the Baptist at all, especially after the brood of vipers comment. They just didn't like him at all. But they were pressing into biblical orthodoxy, and typically this verse is limited to that concept. Absolutely it's not. To contend for the faith, we're talking the faith that was once for all delivered by the apostles and by the Lord Jesus himself is a demonstration of power that goes along with the proclamation of truth. And it's not just a demonstration of power. And it's not just a proclamation of apostolic doctrine and truth. It's a lifestyle of wholeheartedness in the grace of God. And so when when Jude said, we are contending for the faith, he said, I'm fighting. He goes, I'm pressing against the obstacles, those that are resisting me. I want to see the power of God, and I'm not backing down until the power of God happens. I'm contending for the power of God. That's what IHOP is about. That's not all that we're about, but IHOP is about this ministry. We are contending for the breakthrough of power. That's what we're doing. Night and day, fasting and prayer, we're contending for the power realm to break out. Weak, broken, prone to disoriented, prone to discouragement people, just folk gathered together under the covenant that God would give us the sure mercies he gave weak David if we would gather and press. The covenant he gave us, he gave us in the new covenant that he would treat us with the guaranteed mercies he gave David if we would press into him in our weakness. And he says, David is a witness. He's a testimony of what I'll do for you if you'll keep pressing in in your weakness. We're contending for power, but it's not just power. We're contending for lifestyles of happy holiness, of abandonment to obedience. The, the, our glory is our cleanness to live before God with radiant righteousness in a dark world. It's not just that we want to have power in the platform and secret sin off the platform. It's not just we want good doctrine and a clean life, but no power. We want all three of them. We want radiant righteousness in secret. We want power. And we want to see the faith, the truth that was delivered by Jesus and the apostles. We're contending for the faith. Now, let me tell you this. This kind of faith, there is so much resistance. There is demonic and human resistance to the apostolic faith. If you don't fight for it, you will lose it. You will lose it. The first thing that will go is the power of God. The second thing will go is radiant righteousness. And the third thing will go is, is, uh, is truth. 
People will hang on to truth because somehow they can keep the thing laid out on paper without it affecting their heart. That's the last one to go. And I've heard guys preach on this verse and they focus on the proclamation, the, the necessary proclamation of apostolic truth. I go, wait, there's so much more. That's the easy part. We got all the, the patriarchs and all the books and libraries. We, can, we got lots of help on that. We need a fresh encounter today of bright righteousness and apostolic power to cast devils out today. That's what we're contending for as well. And we're going for it. And I find that there's a, a growing sentiment in the body of Christ that is against us. There's a tide uh, against us. We must resist the tide. And I'm not, I get, the last thing I want to do is create people with a leech spirit and a martyr complex. You'll have plenty of time to, to be a martyr. Believe me, that is going to take care of itself. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy. All the T's are together. That's how I remember this. Okay. Timothy, Titus. Okay, there you go. It works every time. Okay, uh, <clears throat> 2 Timothy 4. I'm not asking, I, I don't want to promote or, or fuel up an elite spirit, but I, I, I want us girded for action. It was one of the, I can't remember uh, the exact quote, so, but, uh, I think it was George Barna or one of the guys that takes the polls for the church. I'm, I'm quite sure it was him, but I, I'd like to actually see it before I quote it definitively. And he said, one of the trends today, he's the one of the guys, that, well, there's several of them who, who uh, study the trends and they analyze. They said one of the most significant trends in the church today in North America is the charismatic church is becoming aggressively and rapidly seeker sensitive. And it says it's a shocking, it's a surprising trend. I don't know that he comments that it's good or bad. I don't really don't know, but it was a surprising trend. The charismatic church, and I'll use the broadest definition of charismatic church. I'm talking about people that have a doctrine and an experience of the manifestation of the power of God and healing and signs and wonders and whatever. The broadest definition. I'm not talking about the charismatics versus the Pentecostals versus the assembly. I'm not going there. I'm talking about the broadest Broadest thing. And there has been, in the 80s and 90s, the church was moving forward in the pursuit of the power of God. One of the great champions was John Wimber. Went all around the Western world. And I mean, that man contended for the power of God. He fought for it. He taught on it. He demonstrated it. When he was tired, he pressed in. When he was sick, he prayed for healing. This guy had a resiliency in the grace of God. He contended earnestly for power. It was beautiful. The, the old uh, uh, statement, seek his face, not his hand. I've said it many times. That's, that's not true. We don't seek his face and not his hand. That's, that's a false doctrine. We seek his face first, but we seek his hand as well. We don't choose between the hand and the face. We just put them in the right priority and go for both. And I've heard many, many people say that. Seek his face, not his hand. And I go, no, no, absolutely not. That's, that's how you're guaranteed to end up with no power in your midst. It says, earnestly seek the greater gifts. That's God's command. And I know that if you don't seek them, they will not be present. And I'm talking about seeking them boldly going after them, burning the boats, burning the bridges. We're not going backwards. We're going after this thing. We seek his face and we seek his hand. We must do both. We just do them in right order. We just do them in right order. My theory is if you seek his hand and not his face, you'll quit seeking his hand and his face in a short amount of time. You'll quit doing both after maybe five, ten years. We seek both of them. We're going hard after both of them. We have to. We've got to resist, resist the tide. We've got to swim against the current. The uh, charismatic church, and, and I'm not overly impressed by the charismatic church. Just, uh, I mean, none of us are, actually. I'm not, I'm not trying to be critical, but I'm not hardly impressed. I'm so desperate for a role model. I've just given up. I just said, let's just a bunch of us go after this, and let's forget finding one. Let's just be one. My goal isn't to be a role model. That's not my point. My point is I'm not waiting for someone to point the way. It's the Word of God. Let's go after this thing. He said the, the most surprising or something like that, I'm not exactly quoting it right, trend of the charismatic churches is gone seeker sensitive. 
I'm not commenting on to one uh, person that's good and to another person that's otherwise. That, and that's none of my business who is to do what and where. But I tell you this, the generation that's the next generation, they have no interest in being domesticated by balance and safety or the claims of balance and safety. They really not. There's this, uh, uh, the church is uh, turned corporate. Me and Sam uh, Storm were talking about that today. It's becoming domesticated. It's being seduced. It's being seduced by its quest for growth and for a notoriety. And regardless how much little power, if the crowds are there and the press is there, no demons coming out, no power being manifest. Man, the crowds, the thousands are coming and we're this and we're in the paper and they're writing up and they're packing out and we're doubling and we're tripling. Beloved, I tell you, it, where I'm living at, that means nothing to me. We want to touch the power of the heart of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only answer for that, for that mounting storm on the horizon. The occult and sin and Satan and all kinds of perversion is mounting like a storm, like a monster, kind of like a giant to pervade the land. And the church is seduced and domesticated and dulled by their pursuit of other things. And the Lord's saying, you will not be able to produce your growth charts and your, and your articles in the newspaper to ward off the tide of darkness mounting in the land. You can pull your newspaper articles. They talked about us. Here it is. And our new this and new that. That will not stem the tide of an unprecedented mounting of darkness that's on the horizon for planet Earth right now. I hear uh, my friends, uh, many, many friends over the years, are saying, well, we're trying to do balance. I said, I believe in balance, but I believe in Jesus' version of balance. And he wasn't considered balanced by anybody in his day. Even the apostles didn't think he was balanced. So if it's balanced by his definition, I like it. If what balance means is a retreat into safety to a risk-free leadership in the body of Christ at the end of the age with no power, I'm not interested in balance at all. It will not deliver anybody. Some guy says, well, I'm interested in compassion. We've got to water the thing down for compassion. I tell you, when that little 10-year-old boy is demonized or has a terminal disease, if you want to show compassion to that family, you don't have to do this or that or the other. You cast that devil out and you give him his life back and you'll have compassion. But, beloved, we have to contend for the power of God. The church is becoming domesticated. It's, it's, an, it's absolutely horrific. Watching it. I mean, many of my friends, 10 and 15 years ago, they were going hot after the power of God. Many of them, their churches are seeker sensitive now. They've read the press and they've seen the growing this and the growing that. And they've been seduced and domesticated and dulled by pursuit of different things. And, and I don't know which one is God and which one isn't God. And it's none of my business and I really don't care because I have enough problems looking after myself. But I'm talking about the trend and not an individual. Because just when you think that so-and-so shouldn't be doing it, God says, who are you to say to my servant? It's like, Lord, I don't have any opinions about anybody. I can't keep my own stuff straight. And I mean that. I don't. But it's a wholesale. It's a wholesale giving over our birthright, giving over our vision. And for such a time as this, God is raising up men and women. Malik, I mean, uh, Micah chapter 2, verse 13, speaking of the Messiah, but it applies to us, those that will break out in order to break open. The Lord said that, that the spirit of prophecy upon Micah said, one is coming who will break out, and then he will break it open for multitudes to follow. And beloved, we got to break out of paradigms. we got to break out of mindsets. we got to break out of, of the bondages. We need to break out or we will never break open. And the problem right now in, that's concerning me is the charismatic community in our nation is so stuck right now. I'm saying, Lord, we need to break out and fearlessly contend for the power of God again. We'll end with this, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 3. And we're going to take this up tomorrow as well for those uh, visitors that are staying over with us. 
because uh, Monday we're doing our fasting, and I like to give a good, let's fast hard this week, on the Sunday before the fast. <laughs> I'm going to go for this thing. Look at this, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come, and I want to add, and now is, when they will not endure sound doctrine. But, a court, but they will have doctrine according to their own desires. They will have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers. They will turn their ears away from truth and be a turned aside to fables. Now, again, this is like a contending for the faith in Jude, chapter th- uh, Jude verse 3. I've heard this read, and, and sound doctrine is, is, uh, uh, is related to dogma and truth and theology, and it is. But, beloved, there is no such thing as sound doctrine that doesn't have power on the other end of it. If you would have went to Paul the Apostle and said, I want a uh, sound doctrine, and we laid it out, his Romans 3, verse 21 to 30, when we got it clear, and we didn't heal the sick and cast out demons and have power and have bright righteousness, you go, wait, you got the, you got the dogma right, you got the ideas clear, but you don't have doctrine, you're not living in truth. It is not enough to have biblical ideas. We want to have biblical experience together. We need to be pursuing it. I can't make the experience happen, but together we can pursue it and we can line ourselves up with the heart of God. Look at this. The time will come. They will not endure this. And that's what's happening right now in our nation. I mean, they're hanging true. They're hanging steady to Romans 3. I love that. But they're giving up apostolic power. They're giving up the... Their fight, their absolute demand to experience the deep things of God's heart and intimacy. They have itching ears. They may have massive congregations. But beloved, those congregations, you can gather thousands that have itching ears. They want to be tickled. They want to be told they're right and everything will be fine. Beloved... It's not right and everything's not going to be fine. When that mound, that mounting up of darkness, which is already happening in the earth, begins to break into a new realm of manifestation, we have to be a people of power. We absolutely have to be. And bright righteousness. And we must be a people of sound doctrine in the conceptual sense as well. In the ears of many, so many, I've watched it over the last... Years, so many that had a vision for all that God would give the human heart. Their vision is so low. The fire is all but out. They're just business as usual. They're domesticated. They're seduced. They're dulled into sleep. They're, they're lulled and, uh, into sleep and with a spiritual dullness. And I go, no, no, I'm not. This is not okay. Amen. 